Hi, I'm Ry Walker, founder of Tembo, a managed Postgres company. And today I have Regina Obey and Paul Ramsey, uh, two who are working and have been working on uh, PostGIS for quite some time. Uh, welcome to the show, both of you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ry. Nice, nice to be here. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think I think you guys have all been using Postgres for, for quite some time. Uh, maybe, uh, Paul, when did you start uh, using Postgres? Um, I started using Postgres. Oh, I'm not sure I can give you a version number. I think like six four, <laughs> yeah. um, which I think puts me in like the ninety eight, ninety nine era. Um, and yeah, I was using it as a as a consultant. <clears throat> My first career was in in consulting and uh, working for the provincial government. And we were doing a big data analysis project, and it was a geospatial project, but all the geospatial processing was being done by an external piece of software. And we used Postgres as the backing store for what was a very long like. 20 day compute cycle to spit out all the results for the entire province. Nice. How about you, Regina? I started out as a SQL server <laughs> person. Mm. Yep. Um, so yeah, yeah, Paul dragged me into Postgres. So my first introduction was via PostGIS in 2001, I think mm. it was. So it was like yeah. 7.1 or 7.3, I can't remember. Somewhere between 7.1 and 7.3. It was 7.1, because that was the first first version of Postgres that you could actually do a geospatial extension. Oh, um, nice. And and do you regret leaving uh, SQL Server? <laughs> uh, well, I still consult for SQL Server, and what's yeah. interesting about that is I be, I think I've gotten, a, gotten to be a better SQL Server expert knowing yeah. Postgres, because Postgres would always introduce things first, it had SQL, like the all the lead functions, all the window functions. Uh, Postgres, I mean, Postgres introduced those before SQL Server had them. And the CTEs and everything, yeah. Got it. What's what's the state of geospatial on, on in Microsoft SQL Server, would you say, compared to Postgres? I, I don't know too much about that ecosystem, but I'm curious. Yeah. How, um, par how much parity have they achieved? I don't think, well, I think their geography is still better than ours. But in terms of the geometry support, they're way behind, which is what most of the state people care about. Awesome. Cool. Um, all right. Well, yeah. yeah. So how how has, you know, I'm going to kind of go off off my standard script because like this is a, you're, you know, you how, well, how long have you guys been working on PostGIS for? Like this is one of the oldest extensions or is it the oldest extension? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, so when we started, the extension just didn't exist. As yeah, a it's concept. a pre-extension. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like as a, as a package concept. Yeah. So it's just like the idea of runtime, adding things at runtime to the database, um, which were was there from the very beginning. That was the Stonebreaker original, like this is one of the things Postgres can do. Um, PostGIS is from 2001, as Regina mentioned. She, was, she started using it within three months of the initial release. So yeah, May of 2001. So we're now, yeah, we're at 22 years. So how has it, has it changed much, would you say, since, like, has it been pretty steady uh, progress towards what it is now? Or were there any, like, big milestones, big changes that, that you can remember that are uh, super noteworthy? It has not been, like, one linear <laughs> rise. Uh, it's definitely been punctuated equilibrium. And, uh, and as these things go, like, the most, like, new features and new capabilities happen right at the start. Because we start with nothing, right? You know, we started with first release, it had geospatial types, uh, had a geospatial index, it had eight functions, I think, um, only one of which was analytical in any way. But and that was that was like release 0 0.1 in 2001. I think we got to like 0 0.8 in like two years, like 2003, and that had like the first full set of spatial functions where like you could really test all the relationships between the geometries. You could do constructive geometry operations like buffering the intersections and unions and so on in the geometries. Like that was that was the really, really, really big deal. Um, and and like it could have just like stopped there. And in many respects, like if you look at what SQL Server has, that's kind of what they did. Like they spent, they spent uh, until 2008, they had no spatial at all. And then uh, they came out with their spatial extension, which was basically what they have now. Because it was a you know, capable, complete vector spatial database, full stop. Sure. Um, but since then, like we've kept adding stuff. Maybe Regina will take a saw the tour of what she thinks the biggest things to happen since zero point eight were. Yeah. So I think 
um, post just improved as Postgres pr- improved. Mm, yeah. So they introduced gist and we, you know, all our indexes changed from the old R tree to the gist index. Um, they improve aggregation in Postgres, which I think was a huge milestone for us because a lot of the processing we do involves aggregating um, geometries together. So, you know, we would see something like from a, like a tenfold speed improvement in terms of aggregation of geometries. And then, yeah, things. I think CTEs were pretty useful. <laughs> uh, okay. So, yeah. So now nobody does any yeah. queries in Spatial without using a CTE anymore. Would you say like those those advances in Postgres, they, did they, um, I don't know, like, let's say that they did 80% of the work towards the thing working 10 times faster and you guys had to do 20% or like what was the ratio of, of effort from like where were you getting like great improvements virtually for free without without any effort on your side? Yeah, I think we were getting great improvements for free pretty much. Oh, that's great. And then there's the whole KNN thing, which they drastically improved from 9.2 to... Yeah, I think I was I was uh, making fun of Bruce, and then Bruce said, "I can't believe you'd have to do that. We need to fix it." And so after nine point two, the KNN became real KNN instead of just box KNN. But yeah, in, in all those cases, there wasn't that much we needed to do to get the improvement. Parallelism. Oh yeah, another, parallelism. Another one which is like a huge freebie. Like, look at that. Now yeah. we do parallel. We do parallel processing. <laughs> yeah. The only thing we needed to do is tell people how to configure their, their Postgres comps to take advantage of parallelism. I'm curious, like, what kind of challenges would, did you guys face, uh, I'd say, early on building this? Oof. Um, the biggest thing, well, I don't know. There, there are a lot of things. Um, as a geospatial extension, um, we our, our code isn't packed like into one one hunk of code that we control. Um, we uh, we use a lot of dependent de- library dependencies, and so we end up having a, and we still do having a really complex build almost right out of the gate compared to other extensions. Because other extensions are like, hey, we're a self-contained thing. You just type make, and you're done. Um, whereas with us, it was always like, hey, guess what? You get to track down three or four different other libraries in addition to the thing that we have, and make sure that the right versions. And here's the configuration, and so on. So we end up with this really this really naughty uh, configuration setup, and initially, like that, you're going to start using this stuff back in the day. Um, step one was always to build it. Um, there, they, they weren't prepackaged. Um, Postgres itself wasn't prepackaged. Everything was from source, so it, it took this like fairly steep entry uh, entryway in for for new users. Yeah, although early on we didn't have any other dependencies except Postgres, so it was much easier. Yeah, well, Geos after two years, yeah. and then, well, Proj at the same time. I mean, we had Geos and Proj almost from the start, and then started picking up format libraries after that. Do we have Proj? Yeah, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah. Projection, because Proj already out. existed, so tying it in was a pretty straightforward thing to do. Oh, okay. I don't remember that. Or maybe it was it was an optional dependency. Oh, yeah. So I just never built with it. Everything was optional. <laughs> Tell me what Geos is. I saw, I've seen that uh, mentioned, but I didn't dive in. Is that... Is that powering other other geospatial solutions besides um, PostGIS? Yeah, it is. It's um, GIOS is an acronym, of course. Um, stands for Geometry Engine Open Source. Um, it provides the computational geometry underpinnings for a bunch of sort of the key the key functions. So I mentioned a buffer. That's a GIOS function at the back end. Intersection is a GIOS function at the back end. Uh, the Boolean predicates intersects contains within those are all GS functions at the back end. Some of the like fancier stuff that we've added to GS is now exposed in PostGIS. So if you ask for Del and A triangles or or um, Matisse and polygons, you get those from GS. And then GS because it's like this useful Swiss Army knife of computational geometry is yeah used by other other programs in the geospatial ecosystem. So if you use the Google library, it backs on a GIOS for its geospatial um, operations. And like most prominently, if you use the QGIS desktop GIS, you'll find that the, the Q just backstops its geospatial algorithms. So did you guys refactor code into that or did you just end up replacing some stuff you had built early on with that library later on? Well, Paul started GIOS too. So. Oh, okay. All right. So it's, it's okay. Yeah. So it, 
Sounds like refactored into that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, not so much refactor. I think it was always kind mm-hmm. of a separate yeah, thing, it right? Was. It was always intended to do more. And as an external library, there's actually a, very, there's a slight penalty to using it because um, you got to take your data out of the uh, the Postgres memory space and copy it over into the JS memory space to work with it. And uh, that's just expensive enough that for like simple things, we still actually kept the original native post just side implementations for things like area or length or um, probably the most complex one that we kept distance. is distance. Yeah. Are there are there any uh, any milestones going in the in the future for post just that you're looking forward to, or is it is it uh, just kind of stability and continuous improvement? You go, Regina. Oh no, you're not going to ask me that. Uh, I think speed is always good, um, and my concern. I think in is mostly improving raster and I'm looking forward to Toast's API changes that are coming along and how we can leverage those. That's funny you bring up raster. Maybe we should we should talk about this before we have a little get together. Um, because it's one of the things which sort of left in front of me lately is like the underlying infrastructure we have for handling rasters was built I don't know, about two thousand ten. Anyways, it was built like in an era when the idea of, say, doing cloud-based raster processing was kind of not what would be done. Uh, it was built, built around the idea that you would store your own rasters kind of locally in your, own, in your local area network. That increasingly, organizations just don't do that. They, they still want to have, like, raster access. And while you can do remote raster access with what we have, it's kind of clunky. It's not optimized for that at all. Um, I feel like just, like, a, re, a re-look at what the raster use cases are and kind of a reevaluation of whether how we handle rasters is right is 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 due. I was looking at the API that Alibaba offers on their uh, on their cloud databases and thinking, yeah, that's kind of an interesting way of tackling rasters. So Yeah, they you're talking about like Alibaba's like a they have like a a, a proprietary database or, or their Postgres not their Postgres service. Yeah, it's, they don't say. They're they're really cagey about it. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether it's back then Postgres or not. But their 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 take on rasters is very much all their own. I haven't seen any anyone else go at it that way. Oh, I haven't seen that. I should check that out. But yeah, that's one of the complaints that people have, at least the clients I have, that the out DB is much slower and yeah, that could be improved. Yeah. Great. Um, I was, I'm curious if you're paying attention, I, you know, I, I don't know <clears throat> the difference or, you know, how, I, I've not studied like how post just works or raster or is, but I'm curious like, is the vector search stuff happening? That's happening in in the ML space. Is it how close is that? How closely related is like the math of uh, of that to to the math of? I'm sure you're probably you've kind of paid a little bit of attention to that space. Um, is it com- wildly different, or is it kind of remarkably similar, or, or n- neither of those? Yeah. Well, I mean, insofar as a 2D vector is the same as a how is in D vector. Um, at a conceptual level, they're the same, but like from a practicality point of view, the practicalities of handling super high dimensional stuff are just yeah. different. Um, like one of the first things you learn, even like we go to four dimensions, um, even at four dimensions, the indexing properties start to break down. But like it's the, the kind of sort of standard R tree stuff just doesn't work as nicely. You don't have to get very high up into like a complex dimensional space for like that form of indexing to be like, oh, it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's really... It's not doing what we need to do. And you can really see that in like just how different the indexing approaches are for ML vectors compared to sort of 2D vectors. So like high dimensional, high dimensionality just requires an entirely different mindset and solution set. So I'm, I'm hearing you say, yep. Totally. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just curious if it was a, if it somehow scales into that or, or not. So yeah. Um, that's cool. Yeah. Um, well, tell me, uh, I guess, uh, you're, real quick, like I'd love to learn a little bit more about um, the commercial products, I guess, that you're, you, that you guys, um, you know, how does this manifest? How does Post just manifest commercially, mm-hmm. you know, both for both you and Regina? So, uh, for my side, it's mostly consulting. I don't think, yeah, I don't have any commercial things around it. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Post just, so I, uh, I make a, a sideline, I make sideline in talking about and studying the economics of open source. And, uh, and like one of the things that's like kind of obvious once you start looking at this stuff is that, uh, there's like a project size threshold 
um, before you get start to see um, enough money around a project to support um, full-time maintainership or people whose jobs are mostly around the project. Um, and Postis is interesting in being like one of the few Postgres extensions which has received this, it's like achieved that level. Um, but even at that level, it's um, quite small. <laughs> so, uh, so you've got Regina has, who has a good consulting business. Um, I work for Crunchy Data, which is a professional open source support company, um, which is to say they sell uh, support contracts to Fortune 100 companies and U.S. federal government and increasingly a, a number of international organizations, but of similar size and scale, big organizations, and then also has a software as a service called Crunchy Bridge, um, which is you know, basically a database in the cloud of the sort that everyone's gotten used to. Um, so, I mean, in that respect, I'm kind of like Regina. I'm, I work for Crunchy because they, they value my expertise as a Postgres committer and, and my ability to help their, uh, their customers who, who deploy Postgres. So it's, it's still very much like skills for hire. No one has wrapped it up, has wrapped Postgres itself in particular up as a specific product. Um, yeah. I mean, others have, it's just, we haven't. Yeah. <laughs> And then, yeah, other members of the development team are also still sort of on the on the consulting uh, on the consulting bandwagon, and and, uh, and that's how it works. Who's who is bundled? I, I'm not familiar with anyone who's bundled it up as a product per se. Who's who's done that? Has I mean, it's not so much a product, but like all the um, cloud providers. So Amazon has it. Um, Microsoft has oh, it. Yeah. As yeah. a as um, an installable extension, yeah, as an yeah. installable I mean, that, extension. From the point of view of ubiquity and like market market spread, yeah. CardoDB used to be the closest though, but do they still use Postgres or, or did they switch to something else? Which DB? CardoDB. Cardo. They now? still use Postgres. Yeah, they haven't uh, haven't moved up. That would be like yeah, that would be a good sort of like example of a productization of, of PostGIS. Certainly in their earliest incarnation. Um, they had a software software as a service, um, which did a very good job of allowing you to put data in, visualize it in a whole bunch of ways, um, and that exposed like SQL as the language for customization of what you were seeing. And it was all sitting on top of PostGIS, but you know it was it was marketed as CardoDB, so they had productized um, around a software as a service that more or less made the database not invisible, but the, the actual brand of the database was irrelevant. Do you, do you see um, real old versions of PostGIS Surface? Like, I'm sure you probably don't see 0.8 anymore, but no. <laughs> uh, how, how good are people at staying up on the latest, uh, would you say? Um, I have not as good as I you want to be. I haven't seen any 1.5s recently. I think there might have been <laughs> one. Sure. Your standards, your standards are different from mine, Regina. Because yeah, I like, I'd, I'd freak out if someone brought me a 1.5. I'm shocked at how many uh, version twos are still in the wild. When you count back, um, the that first digit is worth about a year. So we're at 3.4 now. So 3.0. So that's five years. So yeah. So if someone shows up with a two point something, it's a five year old installation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they're probably five versions of Postgres old too, right? And yeah, exactly. Yeah, what's the what's the biggest jump you'll do? I mean, will you take someone from you know eleven to fifteen, or you know Postgres that is uh, the equivalent? Yeah, because yeah, because the latest wouldn't even run on that. Yeah. Yeah, you can wait for. Well, in theory, anybody from Postgres two, you done good with backwards. Should be able to go straight to three point four without any issue, and uh, you know as long as they upgrade their Postgres too. What happens to their development <laughs> their applications breaking that's that's on them well it, it must be nice to be relying on postgres i think as a i mean the, you know you can you can you can uh, criticize like if you would like you know various aspects of how postgres is built but i think that it's really great how stable and and sort of um I want to say it's slow you know that the progress is made because um you know it's, it gives you a very stable uh and reliable you know, chassis to build this on top of. I'm sure you guys agree with that. Yeah, I think in terms of slowness, they're actually much faster than other relational databases. Much, much faster. <laughs> oh, in terms of like uh, how think how fast things change. Yeah, I guess there's that, that there's always that push. Particularly think that yeah, new SQL dialect stuff has come in pretty quick. Yeah, because I remember when I'd be talking to my SQL Server friends, and they're still waiting for the lead function <laughs> that happened like five years ago. You know, 
back in the day. But yeah, it, it I think it moves in terms of the SQL standard a lot faster than the others. I think even faster than Oracle, though I haven't, I don't have too many Oracle friends to well, talk about. Yeah, I'm, I'm frequently, frequently surprised by how much internal churn there is. Because um, I always feel like, oh, we're the super mature extension. Like we don't reach like super deep into the uh, extension, like into the into the core. Like we're not we're not hooking into like executor hooks or planner hooks or stuff like that. Um, and yet there's always this, you know, there's always this medium to long list of things that have to be uh, have to be tweaked when you move up to a new like in terms of our code or for it to build and still run correctly. That has to be tweaked, you know, at each major uh, Postgres release. Yeah, yeah, because I can't think of any release we've done that we didn't have to tweak it for the, you know, the in development major release of Postgres. So they change it enough that it always affects us. Yeah, yeah. So even if the outer shell seems pretty stable, the insides are are changing, and you guys are mm-hmm. you have some stuff poking down, you know, at least to the middle, you know, if not the yep. not the bottom. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, like I said, I think it's I think it's a to me a really perfect pace um, because we do get the kind of like annual you know innovation and if there's something that's that's really important it'll get it'll get taken care of I think so. Um, what I'm, I'm curious are there things happening in Postgres uh, core you know that you guys are excited about maybe for I don't know, we could talk about 17 or, or whatever 18 future. Is there anything in particular that you guys are excited to see? Well, there's bi-directional seems to be making its way. I don't know if it's going to make it into 17, but it looks like they're putting in the hooks for it anyway. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah, um, for me, I'm not so much exciting. It's I've been watching the uh, decade-long crawl towards um, being able to do a, a replicated OLAP system Um where you get like full push down to all the nodes. Um, so every every release, the Postgres FDW folks um, from Toshiba and, and other places like add like a couple more turns of stuff that you can push down, um, which is like exciting to me because like oh we're that much closer we're that much closer to be able to do like big multi node queries because like there's. OLAP, OLAP workloads and LTP workloads um, for spatial databases, really, it's uh, the bias is towards OLAP for sure in terms of what you see, how you see people using the database. I mean, they like transactionality, they like to be able to manipulate their data. Um, but when it comes time to like ask, like, what is this for? It's like, oh, yeah, we run big analyses. So, like, the ability to push stuff out to multi nodes as that gets more mature, as it gets more possible, like that becomes something that's really exciting. Um, on the spatial side. So I watch every little tick of the gears towards that end point and get very, very excited. So it's been pushed down in the last couple of releases. Uh, last release had good stuff around parallelization um, in the planner and ex- ex- executor as well for um, partitions, which is like, that's a big deal because like the holy grail is you've got your big table partitioned out across the remote nodes. Um, so each of your partition is actually a foreign table um, and when you run a query, the planner says, oh, look, I can just ask all the partitions to run it simultaneously. It gets back the result, assembles it, and says, here you go. Um, we're quite getting close to that, uh, which would be a big deal because there's a whole bunch of workloads that you can just turn into sort of like a standard OLAP star schema, you know, one big fact table, a bunch of dimensions, um, and you'd be able to do lots of, lots of really cool spatial stuff that uh, right now, not so much. I don't know when we'll ever get to like the holy grail, which is to be able be able to do like um, shipping data um, between nodes in order to allow nodes to do things like uh, join across these across two big fact tables. Um, that might never happen. It doesn't, I don't see anyone doing that. But that that that's the one that would like having me tearing my clothes off and dancing in the street. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So that's interesting. So that's, I mean, you're you're talking about like uh, I, I haven't all the development of Postgres FDW. I used it recently and it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty powerful at, at, at low scale, but you're talking about at high scale, at OLAP scale, you know, uh, just optimis- optimization across. And Paul things. has this fantastic foreign data wrapper, a Got spatial it. foreign data wrapper, which can read how many formats? Oh, how like 800? Many? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, there's not that many formats in the world, but I don't know, several different. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, formats of of, of geospatial uh, formats. Is that what you said, or other types of formats? Uh, geospatial formats, but to an extent, geospatial formats is a category which also includes non-geospatial things. Because all you have to do is like not have the geospatial column, and then yeah, you know, what do you call it? Oh, it's just a format. So you know, like Excel it can be a geospatial format. Got it. And what's, it's something that you can read. Um, SQL Server. What's the name of that? What's yeah. the name of that extension? Or that this extension is oh. called OGR under our FDW. OGR. Yeah. It stands for? Uh, well, OGR is like, it's not even worth trying to unpack it. OGR is just, is just the vector side of the, of the GDAL library, which also has an acronym, which is not worth okay. unpacking okay. anymore because right. it's a 20 year old acronym. Um, Got it. but it, it, it refers to the library that it's binding. This is the OGR okay. library for, for vector formats. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'll check that out. That's cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of wrapping this up on, on the, the core, like, you had a magic yeah. wand and you could add any feature to Postgres, you know, of course, if that was added, then you immediately have work to do in, in post get just <laughs> as well. But like, what would, yeah. the, what would your magic wand, you know, manifest this weekend in Postgres if you could pick one thing? Yeah, I can't think of anything. Oh, I know what Regina's is. Oh, come on. I'll tell you what yours is then, Regina, if you're not going to say it. It's, oh, okay. Uh, tell me. Tell me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, yeah, you guys can answer for each other it's, if you uh, want. <laughs> it's handling extensions in a slightly different way. Or sorry, had an extension update in a slightly different way. So extension versioning. Um, oh yeah. How did you read my yeah. mind? I, I completely forgot about it because I gave I gave up yeah. hope on it. <laughs> yeah, tell me about that. So Sandro, who's also on the Postgres team, um, he's been working on uh um uh, update to the extension machinery that would allow us to reduce our upgrade script to one file because <laughs> right now we ship like 500 files which are all pretty much just sim links to the same thing and so it's just a way to yeah. have the extension machinery understand that hey this script can be used to upgrade this version, this version, this version, you know, and this version, instead of have to, having to itemize every single version upgrade. Yeah, the uh, extension upgrade machinery is very clever, um, but it ha it starts with an immediate assumption, which is that as a developer, you will manage your extension upgrades as incrementals between versions and then it will cleverly find the path through the incrementals from the version you have to the version you're going to applying all the little slices on the way. And it uses Dijkstra for that. Yeah, yeah it's super clever. Um, even like in the best case scenario where you were that, where you'd already been doing that, um, it's probably not super ideal for the, for any project where the um, development path isn't linear. Um, so post just has, I don't know, 25 or so like minor releases, like X dot Y. Um, and then within those, there's maybe five patch releases across each of those. Um, and we will have, uh, so we will have a whole bunch of like parallel version trees, right? You're on. 2.3.5 and you're going to go to 2.3.6 but then you might want to go to 2.4.8 um, and uh, that means you have to have all these individual even if you're doing things like one tiny step at a time you would have all these individual little hops across the branches um, if you have just one line it kind of works you just sort of chain together this one little line and you don't have very many files when you have all these little branches all of a sudden you need all these extra little hops across the branches and it's made worse because all of our um, management of the SQL side of it, um, the SQL side of the extension where you define the functions on SQL land and say, oh, it's over here in the, in the dynamic library. Um, we've been managing that since pre-extension world. And our way of managing it was to have a SQL file which can always be cleanly applied against any previous version. Um, so it's quite long. Because it has the SQL file has every single definition of every single thing in it. Um, so how do you handle the incremental thing from 1.2 to 1.3? Well, you have one copy for 1.3, one copy for the um, upgrade as well. Um, so every little upgrade has a full copy of that fairly large SQL file. On Unix systems now, we just ship symlinks instead of syncing the whole file. Um, 
but you end up with just a huge pile yeah, of actually files. Yeah, actually we changed from that to just a file that has nothing in it. Right. <laughs> to just on any version. Yeah. Which kind of... The chain, the chain eventually arrives at the full one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now that's the same across. But I, I think ours is more complicated too because for each version, we support multiple versions of Postgres. Yeah. So... And we also enable new features. If you're on like 12, you get something. If you are 11, you don't get that something. So certainly something which is not contemplated by the original designers is our yeah our our file, our input file is um, actually goes through. We put it to the C preprocessor um, before we give it to Postgres because um, we have a whole bunch of if defs against what Postgres version you're on living inside the SQL file that have to be pre-processed before it's usable. Yeah, I understand now. Yeah, it's like, yeah. But it was just, maybe you're saying like the, the current design is just naive thinking that uh, you're not going to try to support multiple versions of Postgres with one of your versions of the extension. And, and there's not a home for that information, I guess, uh, for what the range is to some degree. Yeah, I mean, although the extension framework does like contemplate the idea of versioned um, extensions again, it doesn't really contemplate them as anything except for a linear yeah. chain. And once you have a more complex situation than that, it's kind of hard. Like, we for a very long time um, supported being able to run different versions of PostGIS inside the same Postgres cluster. We still do actually support that, um, but it's a feature that it seems like mostly only developers use. So, we it's optional now, and we default just to like one version of Postgres or PostGIS for each Postgres cluster. Um, but that, you know, that functionality was always there but the extension facility like did nice. not did not grok that um yeah and packagers did not grok that either so they always always ship one <laughs> great uh I'm, I'm curious i try to wrap up here a little i, I realize now i've been kept you here for quite some time uh but uh do, do you do either of you listen to podcasts very much i do all the time it's my uh it's my gym thing i go down to the garage gym and that's what keeps me from going crazy with boredom so give me your give me some of your favorite podcasts. Uh, I tend to go on the current affairs side, so I listen to the Ezra Klein show from New York Times a lot, um, and uh, Odd Lots from Bloomberg, a little bit of financial news. Yeah, you can tell he's the son of a politician. Yeah, it's interesting <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Regina? No, I'm not a podcast person. I go swimming, Got it. but yeah, there's <laughs> I can't really hook up a podcast while I'm swimming. Yeah, that's underwater is probably, I mean, it's probably possible, but not so, super comfortable, right? <laughs> uh, great. All right. Well, uh, so where can, where can listeners find you online? Uh, maybe uh, share your websites or, or Twitter, or Mastodon handles. I am, uh, yeah, on, on the site formerly known as Twitter. I'm P.W. Ramsey. I'm also P.W. Ramsey at uh, mastodon.social. And uh, on the blog world, I'm at cleverelephant.ca. Yeah, I have, uh, how many blogs do I have? I have bostongis.com, postgresonline.com. <laughs> uh, Twitter is just Regino Bay. I think that's in my, in my website, paragoncorporation.com. I guess those are, oh, and my book site, postgis.us. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the book site, what's that? You you uh, post GIS, post, I always say post GIS, by the way, I got to learn it's post GIS, but like, do you have a book for around it or have you written many books or what? Oh yeah. So I wrote post just in action. Um, I'm working on PG routing. I'm also supposedly working on a Postgres book. <laughs> um, both of which I'm very behind on. And, uh, I, I did SQL in a nutshell. <laughs> um, and let's see what else. Is that it? Oh, and Postgres Up and Running. That's a pretty popular book. Surprisingly oh, yeah. popular. Yeah, it's it's, mine. it's sitting right there. I, I own that one. Oh, really? Thanks for writing it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both for joining. I uh, appreciate you, uh, all, the, all the work you've done for Postgres and PostGIS, and um, appreciate uh, having you on the show. Thanks right. for having us, Ron. Thanks, right, Ron. Thanks. Bye. Bye.